Okay, so it's my, my pleasure to welcome Reto Müller and Stephanie Kreuter um, for a little interview about their book that has just been published on the use of force to protect. Reto Müller is a lecturer at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences in Winterthur. He is also a lecturer for security and police law at the University of Basel and for public law at ETH Zurich. Stephanie Greuter is uh, a police officer in Basel. That's an interesting combination. Um, and also you dedicated your book to a police officer, to, to Fatima. She was a, a responding officer at the, at the Bestland hostage situation in, in 2004. Uh, I remember that quite vividly from, from the TV coverage at the time. So my, my first question to you is, how did you get to the topic of anti-terror anti operations? And, and what led you to, to, to investigate the entire jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights on Article 2 of the European Convention of human, on Human Rights? Mm -hmm. uh, Fatima D was uh, the only police officer responsible for security at school number one in Beslan. There was a terror warning given by the authorities but she was left there without any means of communication and without any uh, other uh, equipment uh, such as arms. And she made uh, the best uh, out of this situation uh, finally, and she survived. Um, on the beginning, there is uh, the judgment in McCann and others versus the United Kingdom. I have... Uh, dealt with this in my lectures at university. This uh, judgment, McCann, is basically the beginning of the interpretation of Article 2 of the, of the European Convention on Human Rights by the court. The Grand Chamber has examined the failed arrest of three IRA terrorists in 1995. In doing so, the court has expanded the examination from the deadly shots by the SIS soldiers to the operation of the security forces in Gibraltar as a whole. In the last years, further judgments followed. Both uh, Finogenov and the before mentioned Tagayeva versus Russia were about stormings and rescue operations in a theater in Moscow and a school in Beslan, respectively. In these operations, Russia has violated Article 2 of the Convention on different levels. These judgments made us take a further look on the court's case law. Tagayeva and Finogenov, while building up on McCann, are more complex. The more recent judgments also include rescue measures. This motivated us to stretch the arc from Gibraltar to Beslan. Okay, so I, I saw that in, in your, your uh, 600 pages book, you, you process roughly 190 judgments and decisions of the European Court on, on Human Rights. Um, this, this can hardly be all about uh, anti-terror operations. What is all this jurisprudence about? Well, uh, the 600 pages weren't uh, foreseeable, uh, at least uh, not to us uh, at the beginning. But uh, apart from the additional case law on police and military operations, we have also included cases on the use of force by police authorities in general. In addition to the requirements for operations, the legal basis in the states must also be adequate. The standards set up by the European Court of Human Rights are strict, especially for the use of firearms. The phenomenon of terrorism also has a strong impact on the freedom of communication. For a debate and the guarantee of the respect resilience in civil, civil society, this jurisdiction on freedom of expression is therefore also decisive. Here, social media lead to new challenges. So this whole uh, jurisprudence of, of the European Court and human rights on, on the right of uh, right to life, is it not somewhat far away? Um, what, what is the relevance uh, of all this for, for Switzerland, for other Council of Europe states? 
that are not involved directly? Well, a judgment of the court is, of course, only legally binding versus the state specifically involved. We show that the court has created a minimum standard on Article 2 of the European Convention. The content resulting from that case law is valid for all the states belonging to the Council of Europe. Therefore, most of our cases are indirectly relevant for the other states. And uh, security, uh, state security forces face similar challenges in all states. The court sets up uh, basic guidelines. It is not likely that the court would rule differently on the use of force by security forces, depending on the state concretely involved. Therefore, the states less affected by terrorism can learn from the laxity or mistakes in the legal frameworks or in the approach of other states in their anti-terror operations without having to repeat the mistakes themselves. So, so speaking of mistakes and learning from them, um, after your, your analysis, what are the lessons that can be learned uh, in general? So uh, Article 2 of the European Convention contains three legal aspects that are, that, that are equally important. The negative obligation prohibits any use of potentially lethal force, which is no more than absolutely necessary. The positive obligation requires the states to set up legal and administrative framework to adequately protect human life. The procedural obligation requires the state authorities to carry out an effective investigation, timely, independently, and in a way that is appropriate to impose sanctions to the persons responsible for misconduct. Okay, great. Thank you so much for uh, sharing a bit some, some insights about your book. Um, the book is available on weblaw.ch slash use of force to protect. It is available as an ebook. It can be downloaded for free. Um, if you're a bit more daring, you can also um, download the German version of it or also order a, a printed version of the, the German language uh, book. So again, uh, thank you so much again, Rito and Stephanie, for this, this interview. And thank you for choosing uh, for publishing with, with Edition Weblaw. And um, yeah, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much.